When people talk about estimates, they talk as if all estimates are exactly the same. And I think there's lots of different kinds of estimates, different types of estimates. But first, it helps to understand really what an estimate is. An estimate is really a probability distribution function that looks something like this, where it, you know, it starts to slow, then it has this long tail that goes on. Right? So if you look at it, you can see that it has a minimum point. That is, there's a point here which we're not ever going to be faster than or cheaper than or something like that. And it could go out to, well, <laughs> infinity and beyond. Right? That's what an estimate is. And so looking at that, if someone says, what's your estimate? You give them this whole curve, they're not going to be very excited about that. So we tend to pick several points on this curve. We pick points like the best case. And this is where most people typically estimate, if you ask them for a single point estimate, they'll come up with the best case. One that has very little probability of coming true. If you think about the area under the curve, there's not much of it there. There is the worst case. The worst case is much further along the curve here, and it represents an area of higher probability. And there's the most likely case, something in between, usually at the highest point in the curve or the one they think most likely. That is an estimate. But it's not still very useful because people are asking for estimates for different reasons. One reason that people want an estimate is that they want you to make a promise. And so if we look at our curve here again, what number are we going to use for our promise? Well, it's probably that we want to use the worst case. Why? Because that's the one, if you look at the area of the curve, has the most area. It has our highest confidence. But I don't like the term worst case personally, so I often call it my promise case, right? Promise case here. This is the one I'm willing to promise. And it works really well to making promise because I have the high confidence in it. Unfortunately, we can't always make the promise the way we want to because on software projects, we still face with our old friend, the cone of uncertainty here. Because it's called the cone of uncertainty because at the beginning of project, there's lots of decisions we still have to make that we're not made yet. And so given all that uncertainty, if we wanted to make our true promise case, we'd have to make it you know, way up there at the higher end of that cone. And if we were to share that with our stakeholder, they just might, oh, freak out, right? Because it's going to be such a huge number. And so to make it so they don't freak out, we have to delay that promise for a while to we're further enough in the project where that high confidence point is not such a big number. Now, occasionally, I hear some of my clients say, you know, they try to make me make that promise case way out, promise case, way out here in the front, where I really don't know it. Well, those people are basically evil. And all we can hope for is that the gods will come along and strike them down, and we don't have to worry about them anymore. All right. Another kind of estimate we need to make is go, no, go estimates. Go, no, go estimates are really handy where we're in the cone and we're way out there in that early part where we know we can't make any kind of good promise. But what we can do is we can say, you know what? I think we're O right about here. How much is it going to take to get O to here, right? That's the kind of thing. Is it worth proceeding on to that other point? And so we're going to take a look at that and go back to our curve and say, okay, what points make sense to talk about here? Well, we don't want to talk about the worst case because that's way up there and it's not very helpful. So we're going to end up with these two other cases here, the best case, most likely case. But I like to shift their names here again too. I like to talk about at least case. That here's a number saying we've got to at least be willing to pay this. If we're not, not a good idea. And my planning case. This is the case I use for just sort of planning out the idea, to kind of get a hold of it. And so when we share that with our stakeholder friend, looking at these two numbers, they can say, yes, given those two numbers, the at least and planning, I think this is a go. Let's keep doing it. Or looking at those two numbers, they can say, you know what? This isn't really going with the ROI I was hoping for, so let's kill it, right? So planning case, either go or no go. That's what we're talking about here. And if some evil manager comes along again and says, you know, hey, let's get committed to that number, well, we can just boot them off and not pay attention to them because these numbers are not good for making promises. Trade-off estimates are when we have two competing ideas and we want to see which one's sort of the better idea. Here's the example. Let's say we've got two people and one person likes option A and another person likes option B. Well, typically what happens at this point is that we get into some sort of arm wrestling match, whoever yells the loudest or screams the loudest or has the most friends in the VP position sort of gets their way. 
but we really want to make this decision based on ROI. That is, which one's going to give us the best return for ourselves and our consumers? So to do that, we're going to use estimation again. And we're going to estimate now, looking at our estimate curve, we're probably going to focus mostly on that most likely case. Because if we use that, and here again I want to change the name to something like comparison case. If we use that for comparisons, I can then say, oh yeah, this looks like a better ROI than that one. And as long as I estimate the same way, the comparison case is going to be good enough to help me make that trade-off decision. It's not good enough for the promise, these kind of things, it's good enough for the trade-off. So I can look at either one and say, yeah, I'm going to pick a winner here, right? That's all it's good for is picking a winner on the trade-offs. And again, if we have that person come along saying, I've got to turn this into a promise, we just want to have them sort of move along and get out of the way. One of the more popular forms of estimation today, or popular types of estimates, are my ambiguity estimates. Ambiguity estimates is when we have two people and they're trying to understand if they understand the work the same way. This is particularly useful in my Agile or Scrum team because when we do story point estimates and task estimates, we're not estimating for promises or even trade-offs often, we're estimating as an ambiguity check. Here's the example. One person has an idea of how big something is and the other person has an idea how big it is and then using estimates to express how big it is and we're asking, are they in agreement? And so when we look at the kind of estimate we're choosing here, well, it's good to have all three points. We're not going to use the worst case because, you know, that's usually too far out. It'd be nice to use the most likely case. This is hopefully closer to the true nominal estimate and a better reflection of the work, but typically that's still hard to get. So we're going to often use just the best case estimate. The best case estimate is the one that people sort of go to out of their guts. And for ambiguity check, it's going to be good enough. So we use that best case estimate and we're going to go back to our two people here and if they're in agreement, then we say, yeah, the ambiguity here is low, let's keep proceeding on. Is the number the right number? Who cares? We're not using it for that purpose. We're using it to see if we get agreement. And if we have disagreement, that's going to stand out quickly. I say it's a 13, you say it's a 3, we got disagreement here. We can have then a conversation about how big it really is so to start bringing out more information. That's the real purpose here. And even if we agree, if that person tries to say, hey, we're going to turn this into a promise, we've got to take that person and squeeze them out of the process because the purpose of an ambiguity type of estimate is just to see if we see things the same way if we are coming together. My final type of estimate is my merely curious estimate. These are for your stakeholders who say, you know what, I'm just kind of curious how big is it is. Now, these people better be like angels because you're going to do some work for them that really has no benefit besides solving their curiosity. So for these people, I tend to use the three-point estimate. Use all three. But I don't like to use these names because these names carry a little bit too much baggage, so I switch them to these names, the 20, the 50, and the 80. That way, you know, when they, if ever they, something nasty happens, the 80% confidence number is the one they kind of remember. But frankly, for the merely, merely curious, most of the time, I'm just saying, nah, I'm not going to bother to create an estimate for you at all. So, what kind of estimate types do we have? Well, first we have our basic estimate here with the long tail and the three points typically used on the estimate. For our promise estimates, we want to use the promise case, something with high confidence that we may have to delay further into the project to actually do because the number may be too big at the beginning. For our go, no, go estimates, we tend to use the at least and the planning case so people can make that decision whether it's worth going or not going. For our trade-off estimates, we tend to use the comparison case, the most likely point on the curve, because it helps us make that trade-off decisions. Again, it may not actually happen, but we can make decisions if we estimate the same way. For my ambiguity estimates, I tend to use the best case because they're quicker, to easier to generate. And my goal here is not to come up with the perfect promise, but to say, yeah, do we understand the work the same way? And if I ever do one for the merely curious, I'm going to be using the three-point estimate, the 20, the 50, and the 80. But either way, remember that an estimate is a whole distribution that you can use all kinds of point for, for different types of estimates. And only when we make that promise, we've got to make sure we're using the right type. Otherwise, we've got to tell that person, just move along.